Greetings, attendees, and welcome. If you could please type your name and where you're tuning in from in the comment box, it should be much appreciated. But also, like this video so others in your network can also enjoy the content. Welcome to IFMA's newest webinar on Global FM Technology Procurement and Best Practices. The final report will be available for purchase in the IFMA bookstore in a few weeks. Participants who participated in the study will receive a link to the free copy of the report. The link will allow you to view the report via web browser only. A PDF document will possibly be released in the first quarter of 2023. Today's presenters are Brian Lyons, PhD, PE, FMP, Associate Professor, School of Engineering, Civil, Environmental, and Architectural Engineering at the University of Kansas, and Jake Smithwick, PhD, MPA, Associate Professor, Graduate Program Director, Construction and Facilities Engineering at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. Over to you, Brian. All right, very good. Thank you very much, Nick. And thanks everyone for tuning in uh, across the globe, whether it's morning, afternoon, or otherwise for you. We'll be diving into our topic here today, uh, procurement of technologies for FMs. As uh, Nick just mentioned, this is a part of an ongoing research study commissioned by IFMA that is wrapping up in the final phases, phases of the study itself. So we're happy to share some of those results, the learnings and lessons learned coming out of that study here with you today. In terms of our agenda, we'll start by recapping the research questions that we were trying to tackle in this study We'll provide an outline of what to expect in the report itself once it comes out. Uh, and we'll do that by also sharing some of the key findings that we came across along the way. And then we'll wrap up by talking more about the current state of facility management, technology procurements, more lessons learned and considerations after you get out of the procurement stage and you launch into the technology deployment and adoption stage within your organizations. Those of you who attended World Workplace a couple of weeks ago may have seen a similar session here presented by my colleague, Jake. So if you have seen that before, welcome back. Hopefully it was valuable. Uh, this will be largely similar to that content and we're happy to continue sharing more of it here with you today. With that, Jake, take it away. Okay, thanks so much, Brian. And again, thank you all for being here today and I will go ahead and jump straight into this. Um, so when we think about why we did this project and why we undertook this, there's a couple of motivating factors here um, as to why we, we thought about this. Being that this is October and our Halloween month, there's lots of scary data that were um, actually should scare us when you think about IT procurements. There is a chaos report uh, that has published about um, different challenges related to IT procurement. In fact, they found more than 70% of projects are challenged or failed, right? I mean, think about that. <laughs> if out of all the projects you had, 70% of them failed. I mean, that, that would not be successful by any stretch of the imagination, right? This is IT, right? Oxford University of McKinsey did a different study. 66% cost overruns, 33% schedule overruns, 17% shortfall in the actual scope of the original plan, right? So regardless of the source of it, you know, the different uh, sources of data you see here is that IT projects are really difficult. We talked to IT execs, actually we did, when there was another study out there that talked to IT execs, and found that an IT project is almost always or always guaranteed to fail from day one. I mean, think about that, right? If you were to go into a project knowing that the project is basically not going to be successful <laughs> and you knew that before we got started here, I mean, that's a very difficult situation to, to put yourselves in. Now, I will say that one thing that, um, that we do have here is that uh, a, a white paper that summarizes a lot of the other data around IT projects and some, some of the challenges. If you have an interest in that particular white paper, that is actually ready to go and available. So just be sure to email uh, Brian or myself, and I'll be glad to provide that to you uh, with that. So in terms of uh, how that sets the stage for our discussion here, there's really two main questions that we have as we went through and developed this, this particular study. The first one is, as an FM organization, and you decide to buy a new technology, software, hardware, whatever it might be, how do you actually go about procuring it? What are the best practices in terms of how you actually accomplish that? Knowing, knowing that there's so many challenges with IT. The second one is, 
best practices, resources, and steps specifically going through and doing that procurement, right? So a little bit of definitions here when we talk about this, what do we actually mean by technology? This can be software, this can be hardware, it can be data management or analytics, related professional services attached to those different uh, so software or hardware. And really it's focused on where does FM have heavy involvement on the project team? Sometimes we've seen that FM is not involved until the very end. Sometimes FM can be involved very early on and that's a benefit. So <clears throat> depending on the level of involvement of the FN kind of influences how we how we look at this. Excuse me one second. Sorry, I kind of lose my voice here, folks. Sorry about that. <clears throat> so when you think about the life cycle of a technology procurement, there's really a couple key phases of this, right? The first part of this is the master plan, which kind of sets out here's the reason why we're doing for not doing this particular uh, this project. There might be a roadmap for the FM organization. Uh, and, and really a key part of this here too is really this go, no go decision. I mean, think about all the projects that we've had that may have not gone well and ask ourselves, should we have even done the project in the first place? Now, certainly we understand that sometimes you have to do it. You have to get a different system. Otherwise, you know, our, our organization can't meet its fundamental requirements, but many times, I think that an honest go no go discussion would warrant um, serious consideration to avoid a lot of these different challenges here, right? So that's the first step is to have a master plan that lays out what the strategy is to deliver this project. The second part of this is actual procurement, which means setting the scope, developing the RFP, the different product demos and other evaluations is a key part of what this procurement activities might be involved with here. We then move into legal after you go through the procurement process to identify the software or uh, integrator or the different team members that will be involved with delivering this project. Uh, there will be negotiations, licensing details we worked out, and we move through the legal paperwork required to hopefully come to an agreement and eventually a contract. Once that is finalized, we move into deployment, which is a unique phase if you compare this to like construction or other types of non-IT procurements. Deployment is not something always that we have out there. Really what this is here is able to roll out the procurement in terms of the, the project for actually telling the users, here's a new system, here's how you use it, and people start using the system, hopefully for a long-term approach, which leads us to our, our final project, uh, final phase here of the life cycle, which is when you think about IT, don't think of it as we're buying a new system that does something. Think of it as an organizational change event. We're going from doing things as one way to something different in the long run. We're changing fundamentally how we do business. So if you think of a new software tool or a new hardware tool, think of it as doing business differently, not just going to the store and buying a new piece of software. There's a lot more to it uh, than that. So our research focus of uh, this particular project is focused on the procurement side of things. We find that a lot of research that Brian and I have done over the years here is that if we can get this procurement side of things done correctly, this saves all sorts of issues later on down the road. So it makes sense then that we spend the time and effort upfront to specify what we're looking for, hire a qualified team and an outstanding product that can minimize issues that we see so often, right? So that, that's why we're focusing on the procurement side of this overall project. So when you think about the outline of the report, we're going to go through in detail what this is going to look like, and we'll go through and provide some examples of each one of these uh, situations here, right? So there's really six major sections to this report uh, that once it's published, you'll be able to go through and get lots of different examples of this. Uh, the first part of this is meant to have the current state of how things are currently done in IT procurement. The way we did this here is a couple different ways. We collected uh, north of 100 FM technology RFPs. So think of CMMS, uh, work order management systems, other technology solutions in the FM space. And we conducted an analysis of how these things have actually uh, done that. We also looked at different timelines from when we released the RFP to selecting the vendor to negotiating. And we looked at common timelines throughout these different RFPs uh, that we looked at. The second thing we've done here so we've taken all these different RFPs and we've put them in an online digital library where people will be able to come in and sort and organize it by the type of project that you're looking to buy. 
probably one of the most common questions that we get here is, does anybody have an RFP for fill in the blank for this type of service? Well, the way this is going to be structured is that as you go into the RFP library, it'll be organized by different types of technology systems. So whether it's CMMS, whether it's access control, work order management, it's organized by different types of technologies that you yourself may buy. Now, we're not saying that these are good or bad RFPs, but rather it's a resource to see what other people have done in this sector. The second part of the report are technology spotlights. And as I alluded earlier, in terms of the RFP li library, in terms of the technology types, we have room reservations for private businesses. We have CMMS uh, focused primarily in healthcare, uh, access control, and then work order management systems. And this is, comes from an electrical utility company and how they adopted these particular uh, solutions. We do provide a brief case study of each one of these here and provide a lot of the details about how it is actually done. So these, these case studies are beneficial because even though you may not be buying exactly the specific solution that we're looking at, it provides a lot of details and insights that once you yourself had to buy this, you know uh, what the lessons learned have been and the key things to think about as you deploy a similar type of IT solution. The other thing we also did with this is we talked to uh, vendors or suppliers of these different types of systems. And there's really three main things that we focused on is the technical side of things, the political side of things, and the financial side of things. Now, for those of you that are on the owner side, meaning that you're a facilities professional, there's actually that a lot goes into the vendor side in terms of whether they, how they make the decisions to pursue a project with us as an organization. And there's some key things here that we also will discuss here at the end. The next section focuses on the, the seven major takeaways from the current state in terms of how do we actually do that. Uh, common challenges, lessons learned, uh, the tips for gathering requirements and scope of works. You know, when I was at uh, Nashville uh, World Workplace last week, we had a brief and formal uh, survey <laughs> in terms of how many people enjoy doing their scopes of work. And we asked everybody to raise their hands. If you enjoy writing the scope of work, raise your hand. And uh, it was an uncomfortable laughter because nobody likes doing that, right? I mean, uh, we had a webinar probably about two years ago about how to actually develop scopes of work. And I think, Brian, we had like 800 people on this call here, right? The fact that writing scopes of work is so challenging to many facility professionals is a key part of how we can think about how do we have better IT projects is by defining better what we want to look at, even though it may not be perfect, which is okay, but spending some time up front with this can make that more beneficial. The next part of this is looking at how do we actually prepare for the IT implementation. You've gone through the procurement. You kind of know where you're going to go here. So now the question is, OK, what do we do next? It's not just sign the contract, download the software, and call it good. There's actually a lot of details that goes into laying this out and convincing people, really, that they need to use uh, this new system. So think of it in terms of an organizational change management event meaning that we're not buying software, we're convincing people, we're showing people how to use a different technology to do what we've done in the past year. That hopefully at the end of the day is more efficient, right? It, it's a big deal to go from, I've always done this and now we're doing something different. It makes people really uncomfortable in terms of how they do things. The next part, chapter five of the report is looking into what does the future trends hold for our procurement? Uh, future uh, forecast, uh, different technologies that might coming out. We lay this out um, in terms of today, new trends that are coming out. The next five years and also the next 10 years, what are some major things that if you are a facilities manager or a facility professional, key things that you need to be thinking about as the, the future kind of rolls out here as we look into this. And finally is uh, a group of different resources, tools, templates, checklists, different things to help enable um, different things that can make this um, effectively here, right? So again, we'll have our RFP library, which will have uh, a couple hundred different types of RFPs that you can look at. We'll have some checklists and guidance about how to develop uh, better scopes of work and statements of work. We'll have the RFP template, which will have all sorts of different tools to make this process easier. And then finally is once you've selected your team for the vendor is having an implementation plan and organizational change management considerations. So hopefully at the end of the day here that if you go through this report and adhere to the different guidance that's provided, uh, this can make things 
a lot easier. So that's that's kind of a nutshell, I would say a very detailed nutshell, I guess, of, of how this report is structured. And so we're going to shift gears now and go through some of the details um, of that. Okay, so the first part of this are the different uh, RFPs that we looked at, and we did some analysis of what this looked like, right? So current state of how technology RFPs are done. So here's the, the common types of uh, procurements that we looked at. Uh, again, work order management, CMMS, project planning, asset management, space planning is a very hot topic right now for obvious reasons uh, as a result of COVID and how we deal with that. Uh, quick uh, sidebar, in 2020, I think it was April 2020, like right after this whole mess started with COVID-19, IFMA published the space planning benchmark report. And what makes this particular report unique is that it is probably the only report that I've seen in the entire world that benchmarks, here's how space used to be done before the COVID pandemic started. So if you fast forward out to, the, uh, to now, we're actually updating that report to see how the space allocations and different practices have changed over the last three years as a result of the uh, of the pandemic. So that's that's not tied to this project at all here, but the point is, is that when we think about research as an FM and, and how do we consume that research, so we look at relevant practical things that, that make a difference. And certainly space planning software and technology around that is, is a big uh, piece of that. Okay, so we collected uh, 108 RFPs uh, for the last five years uh, across different criteria. And we're now gonna look at what evaluation criteria did the uh, RFPs, the organizations use as part of this. So when I talk about evaluation criteria, what I mean by that is as an owner, what am I going to pick the solution from? So is it based on their price? Is it based on their plan? Is it based on their risk to minimize that the overall procurement? There's different criteria that people use to, to look at that. And here's what we kind of found here, right? The first one, I guess maybe kind of shockingly here is that less than half of the respondents of the RFPs share their evaluation weights. Think about that, less than 48%. Now, why is that concern here? Well, think about it. If you put yourselves in the shoes of the vendor and you're looking to propose from an owner's RFP, you don't even know what they're looking at, right? In other words, if I'm gonna strategize as a vendor and think about, well, where do I need to spend my time and effort on the proposal? I have no idea half the time because the owner doesn't tell us, right? So that, that's a major best practice here is that when you have an RFP, whether it's technology or construction or renovation or whatever, providing the weights in your RFPs is the best practice because it tells the vendors, here's the key things that we're interested in looking at. And this is even more staggering, but frankly, not surprising. About 27% of the people of the RFPs we looked at provided a cost template, right? Now, when you think about how do we cost out things here, especially in IT and other uh, maybe complicated uh, financial evaluations, that cost template for how you look at that is really important. And the reason why is because you want to have an apples to apples comparison across different proposals. If I have vendor A, vendor B, and vendor C, three different proposals and three different ways that the cost is structured, how am I supposed to evaluate that as an owner, right? it's really difficult to do that fairly and equitably, right? Whether you're public or private, it doesn't matter here. Having a way to fairly evaluate, having a fair comparison apples to apples across all our different vendors can make things um, a lot easier. So again, providing those templates are our best practice. And then finally, none of the RFPs we looked at, none of them share their budget. Now this could be an entire webinar talking about this here, but let me be very clear about this. Providing your budget is absolutely a best practice. Now, the common reason why we, we don't talk about that or why owners don't provide that budget is because, well, if I provide my budget, the number I have available for this project, the vendors are going to inflate their cost and meet that budget number. That, that's by far the biggest reason why people don't share their budget because of, of that reason. We're gonna inflate our prices. However, if you think about it, if I'm a vendor, and I have expertise, I need to know that budget number to know what's feasible within your constraints and your requirements. And we could, we're not gonna go through all the details of it here, but just knowing that if you provide that budget number, you know, I'm a vendor, that's one of the key pieces of information. So if we wanna start having better projects and better outcomes, 
tell the vendors what your budget number is, and they can lay out, well, based on what you told us here, you can actually do this project within the, the constraints that you have, right? And here's you know six things here that we should we recommend you change about your requirements to get this project at or below your budget. So if you have questions about that, we actually have a white paper that walks through the best practice of sharing that budget, and we'd be glad to send that to you. Just reach out to us. Uh, but that's again another key practice to make this a successful outcome. So let's go through some of the detail of the criteria that we provided here or that we found in the RFPs. Here are the main things that we looked at. To the right of that are the average weights. So what percentage points do they allocate here? And you can see that there's a lot of variations. So on the range side of things, right? Some of them weighted the functionality at 10%. Some of them weighted at 65%. Implementation plan, 10 to 50. And you can see the different ranges of weights that people applied uh, to this here, right? So here's, here's an opportunity for another best practice. Write this down. We recommend that no more than 35% weight on any one criteria. So regardless of the different criteria you pick here, we recommend that none of them are weighted no more than 35%. Why? Because it makes sure you have a, an equitable or a diverse distribution of criteria and not one thing gets too much weight. So for example, I have an organizations that say, you know what, we're not gonna do low bid procurement anymore. And I said, fantastic, that's great. But they put the weight on price at 75%, right? <laughs> If, you're, if your price weight is at 75%, it might as well be a low bit project. So that, that's an example here of, of having um, diverse criteria and not having too much weight on any one particular thing here, right? That's a best practice, something to think about. The other thing we looked at here is that when you think about the timelines for publishing the RFP, there's, there's a couple of different things that we see in this. So when you think about the, the phases of procurement, there's really four main things that we think about. There's the bidding phase where the vendors, the contractors are putting together their proposals. We have the evaluation phase where us as an owner go through and evaluate the different proposals. You have negotiation where you come together usually with one firm and you talk about here's what the actual details look like. And finally is the implementation phase where you roll out the, the software, the technology to the users and they start using it. So we have different metrics presented here. We have the mean or the average. We have the median, which is the midpoint of the, the number of, of days we have here. We have the minimum and we have the maximum. So if you think about this, uh, this first one here for bidding, uh, it's, it's about you know, a month here, right? So it's nothing too crazy, right? But in general, if you have not enough, like if you have a minimum, like only one week to prepare a proposal response, that's not, that's not good, right? If you're a vendor and you find about at the RFP and they're due a week later, that's a very difficult situation, right? How about on this uh, evaluation side of things? When you get the proposals in, you're looking at this, right? On average, we're at about a month and a half, which to me is is quite a bit, but it can be less. But over here on the right hand side, the, the highest one we found, 14 and a half months, folks. Think about that. You're a vendor, you submit a proposal, you don't hear anything for a year and a half or a year and a quarter, right? I mean, that's a very long time not to have feedback about what's actually going to, to happen here. Regardless of what you do here, is a, a best practice is to publish the full schedule. So your vendors know what the expectations are and also so us internally, we can go through and understand what the requirements are for our particular project. Again, folks, I see that the comments box is, is exploding here, blowing up. So make sure that you post your questions, post your comments here because we're gonna have time for Q&A at the end and we would love to uh, go through and answer any questions that you might have. So be sure to use that as you go through there. Okay, let's move to the next part of this here. statement of work here, right? So again, about 2% of them share the budget, 30% share the schedule, and 5% of them, uh, less than 5% shared the current conditions. So when we talk about current conditions, very simply, all that is here is how do we manage or how do we describe what's currently going on in our environment? What systems do we use? What technologies do we have? What are the problems and challenges we have here? Describing how things are currently going is a best practice. Less than 5% of the RFPs have that in place. As a vendor, if you're trying to attract vendors to work on your project here, that's a key piece of information because they can know what's possible, where your problem's at, and they can offer adequate solutions to, to deal with this here, right? So at this point in time, it looks like we might have one of our first questions here. 
uh, which is how should uh, how do we control the cost as COVID hits the economy very badly, and then the realization of climate changes every day, and the lead time for the procurement will be even less uh, in spite of that here. So, Brian, I don't know, do you want to take a shot at that question, or I'm, I'm happy to jump in here too, but uh, any thoughts about how do we deal with the craziness of COVID and all the challenges that that's going to come about with that? What are your thoughts? I'll, the, uh, I'll have to be honest, my attention was drawn to the, the latter part of the question uh, about requirements changing, which then results in the lead time for the procurement you know, shrinking. And unfortunately, that's a challenge that's, that is not just specific to COVID or other external pressures, to, to be honest, right? The, the challenge of internally within the client organization trying to decide what those requirements should be and the broader statement of work around that can be one of the most difficult parts of the procurement process. And unfortunately, you'll see organizations spend a lot of time there internally, and then they'll crunch that that RFP process to, to make up for some of that time. That's a, and that's a, that's a problem that we see everywhere. I think part of it is um, actually what you have on, on the screen here is helping organizations understand what should be included in a solid and effective statement of work is critical, right? Um, and so even just knowing where to start, how much is too much, what to put in, what to leave out is, is a big deal. Um, and I see another comment coming in from, from Peter here um, that the technology itself is not, not a solution. In other words, it's not the easy button. That's the other big challenge we see, right? As you see, like once this technology gets in here, it'll be the perfect thing. What's the easy button? All our problems will go away. As long as we spend enough time to get all the requirements perfect, then it will become the perfect easy button. And I think part of the reality is that no, that that's, that's not the case. There is no such thing as an easy button. The technology is a tool or a process and surrounding capability to help you accomplish something. Um, so I'm kind of, uh, getting around the question a little bit, but I think that upfront going into the scoping and requirements gathering process with a solid process is one of the lowest hanging fruits that we can start with and not letting it get out of control and get chaotic. Then if requirements do in fact change throughout that process, hopefully you're just managing those changes rather than the broader challenge of just getting our hands around the scope to begin with, which I think is actually where the, the greatest and most frequent challenges occur. Fantastic. Thank you, Brian. And thank you, Gaurav and, and Peter for your comments and questions. Keep them coming, folks. Those are very relevant things that we need to think about with this. So when we think about uh, kind of the big picture with these uh, technology procurements here is that there's a lot of things going on. Uh, the technology space changes rapidly. And because of that, there's actually a lot of opportunities for improvement, right? So in, to summarize here, what we've kind of seen, provide your weights, have a balance amongst those weights, and provide clarity about what your, your schedule is on the RFP. And in addition, some other things here is, again, like Brian said, having a good and accurate statement of work makes things a lot easier. Same thing as well for current conditions. In fact, we have an entire course that covers all these 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 best practices with statements of work, and we're glad to share more, share more with you about that here. But again, statements of work, not easy. So get into this uh, RFP library that I mentioned. So let's say that you have a new procurement coming down the line here. This RFP library will allow you to click on it to log in, and it will be sorted and organized by different types of technology. So we have accounting software, audit software, budgeting, Here's uh, CMMS, consulting services, scheduling, security. We have these organized by different types of procurements and technologies that might be beneficial uh, for you. So that'll be another resource that once we publish the report, that'll be made available to, to folks that, that have an interest in that. So let's go through some of the best practices for uh, tech procurements and some other things to keep in mind here as we think about this, right? Now, there's a lot of things that we can look at on the actual procurement side of things that are beneficial, but I'm just gonna highlight um, a, a couple of things. In our group here with uh, Simplar, we, we actually work with a lot of organizations in terms of developing a better, more efficient RFP process. And so we will offer some insights about what we have found uh, or some of these more advanced practices that make uh, the experience better, right? The first thing is, is to limit the size of the proposal, right? How often do you get a proposal come here that's like 100 pages, all these marketing details, and frankly, it's not beneficial for us in terms of evaluating those different proposals here. So limit the size of your proposals here because it makes it easier for your vendors and it makes it easier for your evaluators not to go through all this detailed information that, that 
honestly, people are not going to look at uh, at the end of the day here. The other thing, I, second thing here is to conduct individual interviews. And what I mean by that is how often do we have an interview come in and you have the whole team, including like the company president, the director of business development, all these other folks here, while they have a place, we have found that on technology buys and other types of procurements that you really want to talk to who? The actual people doing the work. When you have a problem that comes up, you're not going to be calling the company president to come deal with your issue. You're going to call the on-site person. So if we can all agree here that we're really interested in, in talking through and thinking about um, who's going to help us solve our problems, talking with these key people that are going to be on-site and interviewing these key people on-site is a key best practice here. Right? And so when we work with organizations, we recommend to not have group interviews, but rather do individual like job interviews and to talk with the key people. So for IT, this could be the implementation lead. If you have a finance piece, that person might be involved. Um, if you have an on-site person that's going to lead the project, they would be a good person to interview. The actual people that are involved with the project are who you want to talk with, right? The other thing to keep in mind here, too, is we'd recommend to not do consensus meetings. Um, we could tell stories about how consensus meetings have, frankly, have derailed almost the entire procurement. So when I talk about a consensus meeting, really what this is, is the group of evaluators, they get all the evaluations in, and they talk about amongst each other, who should we make the award to? And the challenge with that is that when you do consensus meeting, that if you have somebody who is very, uh, let's say, outgoing or outspoken about their opinion about something, most of the time, that person will have a, a, an influencing effect on who's going to get the award. Or let's say that on your evaluators, you have like a, a company or an organization like a VP or some of that is senior level in the organization. Most times that person will carry a lot of weight in terms of who's going to be awarded the project here. And if that's the case, then what's the point of having an evaluation committee and having the, this fair approach in terms of how we're going to go through and evaluate the proposals? So we would strongly recommend to stay away from consensus meetings because of all the different challenges that are attached with that. There's a lot more packed into that, but if you have questions, be sure to reach out to us because um, it can certainly be something that, that is challenging that we need to be aware of here. Uh, the last thing I, I, we recommend when we work with folks is what we call the RFN or the Request for Needs, RFN. The biggest thing that we think about in RFN is that many times we're not exactly sure in terms of how to structure our RFPs or our, st our, our statements of work. So in those cases, in terms of what you're not sure to do, which by the way, the answer is every single IT procurement is we would recommend to do an RFN process, which is basically a set of a limited number of questions. We're talking to the vendors basically saying, here's our scope of work and here's what we're thinking about doing. What else do we need to provide in our RFP to make this easier for you as vendors to respond to it? And we have found that after I've done this a number of times that vendors will suggest that, you know, you need to provide the current counts of your current users, or we need to know about your more details about your database structure, or we need to understand better details about the quality of your data, right? These are things here that we may not have known to provide in our RFP, but when we do that here, it makes it a better process. The other thing with this too is I would not necessarily make that a mandatory requirement. It's just more of an informal thing to talk to the vendors to help us better structure um, in terms of what's actually going on in our organization, right? And again, we had somebody on LinkedIn post that executive poll is a big issue with those types of meetings. And, and again, that's why we go to the, that consensus meeting and really getting away from that is certainly a, a beneficial and big thing to think about with that, right? So again, Back to our RFN process, uh, the traditional challenge with RFIs, which is what we would normally call them, is that they're not structured. They ask way too much information. And frankly, a lot of the time, the RFIs that come in that I've seen are mostly marketing. There are lots of nice pictures. There's lots of details. It's really just a pre-proposal, like a pre-pre-proposal about what there looks like. And that's, that's not helpful to us as an organization. The vendors just copy and paste. That's not beneficial for them either. So the RFM process, when done correctly, uh, can have huge benefits in terms of the overall project outcomes. It can make things a lot easier, right? So some of the, the questions you think about when you do this RFM process, what are we missing for our scope of work? 
Um, have we defined you know, the fit gap phase in terms of what we're going to deliver on the project? Is there a good or bad time to do the procurement or to do interviews, for example? If there's a very another large project on the street, the vendors to say, hey, you might want to hold this out for a whole uh, week or two or a month or whatever it might be, because there's other conflicts we have in our schedules, and it's beneficial for you as an owner to know about these things. Again, that's a very advanced approach that if uh, folks have questions about that, want to know how to do that more effectively, be sure to reach out to Brian or myself and be glad to uh, walk through that here. Okay, next chapter of the report is preparing for a tech implementation, which again, we could spend a lot more time on that here, but this can be a very challenging thing to, uh, to think about, right? A high performing RFP, we focus on how do we roll out our IT procurement, right? So what do we do next year? So we, we've actually done uh, quite a bit of research in this area and there's some key insights that we have that are really quite interesting, right? We have done uh, some studies about resistance to change. So as an organization, when we think about doing something different, what or how do most people respond to these changes? So what we found is that on average, about 40% of the people are passive, meaning that they'll kind of do it, but they're not enthusiastic. 20% of them are active, like they're actively engaged in rolling out the change, they support it, they go with it, and they make it happen. Finally, the remaining 37% are inadvertent, meaning they're, they're really against the change, they don't want to do it, and that can make uh, things uh, different here, right? So we think about the top five resistance behaviors to changing something in our organizations. Here's the top five. Number one is reversion. Have you seen this before, folks? It's almost like having a, a, like a shadow system, right? So you roll out the new IT system, and maybe you have groups of users that have like their own Excel files. They're tracking the same data here, right? So reversion to how we used to do things is by far the biggest thing that we've seen when we're rolling out new IT buys. <clears throat> the second one is what we call reluctant compliance, meaning that I'm doing it, but I'm not very happy doing it. I'm just doing it because my boss told me to, and so I'll go ahead and I kind of roll things out here. Arguing, we know what that is. I don't want to do this. I have big arguments about it. Lack of transparency, right? Kind of meeting the shadows. Nobody's talking about what's going on here. We don't know really what's going on. And finally, last one here is delaying uh, the outcomes of this. So we spend time or drag our feet. Well, we'll get to it next week or next month. We just drag things out here to actually avoid having to go to the new system, right? Top five resistance behaviors when we think about changing from one status to the next year, right? Now, why is this relevant to us here? What we looked at, and this is probably the more interesting studies that we worked on, is we looked at what does it take to have a positive change experience? Or in other words, of all the people in the organization, what are the, the, the distributions or the ratios of different peoples in those categories, and what does that correlate to? Here's what we found here. Is that in order to have a successful org change event, or in other words, have a successful IT procurement, you need to keep this group of people at about 30% or less for those who are being affected by the change. These are what we call the laggards and the fighters, people that are actively resisting going to and doing something different in the organization. If this group becomes more than 30% of your population, it's statistically shown that it's likely going to be a failed outcome, right? So this is the reality of it. Um, there's a lot more we could talk about that, but that's a big thing here we have to be aware of in terms of how do we lay that out and how do we be successful uh, um, in this. We actually have another white paper that walks through this in detail that can provide a lot more details. We looked at more than 600 change events from lots of organizations and we go through the details of what does it take to actually do a change effectively. Parts of this will be summarized in the report, but we actually have a separate white paper that again, if you have an interest in this, uh, be sure to reach out and we'd be glad to uh, send that to you at the end of the day here, right? So change is important. Uh, the last thing we looked at in terms of change and how to do that effectively, I, I think this is one of our more interesting studies here. We looked at the extremes, what's been a very successful change event and what's not been a successful change event, right? And here's what we found here. If you want your change event to be successful, here's what we found. Provide interactive workshops and on the job support, right? If you want people to take the new system, start using it in its tinted way for their regular day-to-day -day jobs, having workshops and providing help on terms of how they actually run their jobs, that can make things up better here. If you don't want to be successful, then write a speech and send an email, <laughs> right? 
I mean, it makes sense, right? This is not shocking here, but the key is that telling people what to do and then sending them about it, I mean, I mean, they're going to delete it so fast, it really doesn't matter here, right? So in summary, using change agents as a facility manager helps us go from good to great. Having change agents or another is people that advocate for the technologies and the solutions that we're, we're looking at here. This can make things a much better approach. There's a lot more to that, but again, change agents or people that advocate for using new technology is, um, is a key benefit of that. Okay, so the last part of uh, today's webinar here is what does some of the future uh, forecasts look like in technology for now, for the next five to 10 years? And we'll offer some specific things here that uh, frankly, uh, might be beneficial for us as we as we think about this, right? So I see lots of questions and comments. Actually, we'll, we'll take a brief pause here on the RFI uh, side of things here. Uh, Dave's questions like is basically it's uh, the RFN process. Going back to that a few minutes ago, uh, the RFN process is basically an advanced RFI, or we should say a clarified RFI. The RFN is a better way to deliver things more effectively and help us provide. Uh, useful information, right? So again, folks, love the comments and questions. Keep them coming because we are actually watching that and uh, you know, be sure to keep that up here. Okay, technology. So for today, current trends that we found in, in terms of our Delphi panel, uh, increased use of drone technology. In fact, I was involved on a research study uh, and a couple other professors at Brigham Young University is using drones to inspect roofs. Now, I before I, I did this role, I, would, I used to do roof inspections and I'll tell you what, if I had a drone and I didn't have to walk on the roof, <laughs> life would be a lot easier because walking on the roof up and down is just difficult work. It's dangerous work. And so there's a lot of FMs now are starting to use drones to inspect our roofs. It's, it's really quite fascinating. Uh, the second thing here is developing uh, active digitalization of historically physical records. So taking your as-built drawings, making GIS models of them, and eventually turning them into BIM models of our spaces, right? digital copies instead of the physical copies as lost in somebody's office is, is a big thing of what we're doing. In fact, on campus at our university uh, last summer, we had a student that took a 3D laser scanner and he scanned every single, I think there's about 300 mechanical rooms on campus and he made a 3D laser scan and a model of every single room on campus, a uh, mechanical room. And the reason why we did that is because if you need to see inside of a room and see the different you know, pipes and systems that are available for that, having that 3D model can make it um, a little bit easier as, as opposed to driving over there, or you can send it to somebody else who's not you know, local and kind of get a feel for what the, uh, what the current situation is here, right? And of course, hybrid work environments. Uh, we've seen that that's a very hot topic right now. And uh, that's, I, in my view, and what we've talked with folks is that's going to continue into the future, right? The next five years, uh, some things to think about as an FM, uh, a continued integration of BIM, CMMS, and building autom automation. So meaning that there's a much more interconnected that when we have our, our model, we have a maintenance request, all these will be updated together as we make changes and renovations to our sites. It's a very interconnected system for how our building is currently run, right? Uh, data collection will become richer, or big data, we've all heard about big data. Uh, with the with the advent of Internet of Things and other technology about here's where our current system statuses are and different metrics attached to that, that's going to be another key factor that we see is also going uh, you know in the future here. And of course, uh, user friendliness. I, I've used a number of IT systems that are pretty easy, pretty easy to use, and I've had others that are <laughs> it um, is quite difficult. Right, you have to click through ten boxes. It's not sure what to do. There is a feeling that if we want this technology to be further adopted, making it easy to use is a key part of that. But again, just like we talked about about you know, 30 minutes ago, is that technology is not the easy button. It is a part of the solution, but it is not the solution. It's how we think about things and how we get things done, right? And then finally, uh, when we think about 10 years and beyond, um, really the main thing that's gonna come down to is a single source of truth. Right, there is a one centralized system that has all the data about how our facilities are running and we'll all reference that. Our different systems will interact with that as they pull out relevant data, right? Uh, modularization of buildings, not just rooms like temporary walls, but entire buildings that can be changed for fit or use based on the needs of the organization. Uh, Internet of Things, we talked about that. That's going to continue gaining steam because of more data, 
more connectivity, and that's only going to continue. Um, this last one, this or excuse me, this fourth bullet here, application of artificial intelligence to FM, I think is uh, potentially quite fascinating. So if you think about why you know that's listed on here is that as we move forward and as we have more data, artificial intelligence is really good at taking very large data sets and understanding what that data is telling us. So imagine that you have a situation where you have lots of data about how like users occupy the building and what their trends are. Eventually over time, AI will be able to tell us what's the best way to set up our operational requirements for the building or what's the best way to adjust you know, our, our temperatures or whatever different technology you're looking at. AI, in my view, in the future will be extremely beneficial as we look into that and, and what the future may hold with that. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, this last point is having dedicated IT personnel for FM. Normally you think of it as separate silos where you have ITs over here, you have FM over here. Um, what we're seeing a lot, of, a lot of folks we talk to is that in the future, IT and FM will be much more interconnected because we come, we're becoming a more digital world and it makes sense to have more uh, connectedness between FM and our technology groups. So just thoughts to think about. I, for one, welcome our future computer overlords, but just things to think about as we, uh, as we think about this, right? Okay. So in summary here, um, we'll have our, our tools and checklist. Uh, we'll have lots of resources that'll be available uh, as part of the report. So be sure to keep an eye on that. And at the end of the day here, a, a checklist is just that. It's just a checklist. The real benefit of this report is actually using it. And if you're not sure how to use it, definitely reach out, read through the report, and uh, be sure to uh, you know, try to understand how to do this um, effectively, right? So in summary, IT procurement is really difficult, right? I don't want to minimize like how difficult it is, especially if you don't have a plan in place upfront before we get started. Uh, treated like an org change event is not buying, going to Best Buy and buying a new piece of software. It's actually going from one uh, Be sure to email us for a copy of the slides. Um, uh, myself or Brian, you can see Brian's email on the screen here. I'll be, be glad to provide you a copy of the slides or the white papers that we'd be more than happy uh, to do that. So. At the end of the day here, we'll go ahead and take a brief pause here. Are there any questions or other comments? Brian, I know you've been very active on the LinkedIn post. Or Brian, if you have any other comments, uh, now would be a great time to, to add those in here. Not seeing any new questions that have popped up at the moment, but we can pause here and, and let folks um, have a chance to throw those in. Uh, one other thing I would mention um, is that when it comes to technology procurements, uh, Something that we have observed in our experience is that for the larger, more established, maybe more enterprise level technology procurements of which facility managers can absolutely be involved, right? Um, so think asset management and, and things of that nature that are going to be you know, larger and, and widespreading across an organization. Many times we need to be considering that it's really two procurements built into one. It's the technology or the solution itself in addition to the system integrator or deployment effort to actually uh, roll out that technology or that software solution in our organization, get it set up for our environment and so forth. And so a tip that we would recommend is if you are faced with something large and enterprise level, you can use that request for needs process to check whether or not that you should separate out the procurement into two different streams, one being the technology product itself versus secondly, the system integrator side. I know that in our experience, every once in a while we can get surprised with an enterprise level software solution where we are expecting to be able to have a one-stop shop where you go and get the system and it gets in integrated for you. And that's not always how the industry works. And across time, we're noticing that the industry is getting more and more segmented as well. So although Maybe five years ago, one particular approach may have been normal. Within the technology space, things move so quickly that by the time you procure that solution again, you almost have to throw out your experience from five or 10 years ago. So there's another tip um, in, in why we recommend that request for needs process up front and also to, to be thinking about that, that for the larger enterprise level solutions, they can often be a two-step type of procurement of solution first and then deployment team second.
Great, thanks, Brian. Yep. Any other questions or comments here? I'm going to drop our email addresses here in the chat box. Our right, last call for questions or comments, anybody? Okay. Well, if that's it, uh, again, be sure to reach out to us, Brian Lyons at ku.edu or jake.smithwick at uncc.edu. Uh, looks like we have another question from Dave. Uh, do you all agree that this is the best time to be CRN FM because of the need to future proof uh, facilities? So I think that the question really is, is focusing on um, that corporate real estate perspective from an FM standpoint. And Dave, I, I totally agree here. That is a key part of as a facility professional now that we're more, more involved with the space planning side of things and think about what does that uh, future look like is it, certainly uh, beneficial. In fact, last week uh, at World Workplace, we had a small group uh, pilot discussion about what does the future hold in terms of returning uh, people back to the office. Part of the study and why this is so really interesting is that we did a study about a year ago and we asked facility managers over the next three to five years, do you expect your physical footprint of office space to increase or decrease. And about 75% of respondents said that we expect our physical footprint of our buildings to stay the same, All right? So keep that in mind. So 75% of us are not gonna change our physical footprints. Another study we looked at said that of FMs, I think is about 60% of them expect that hybrid work environments are going to be a thing of the future. And so when I look at these two things here, when we have the same amount of physical space, and yet we're having a lot more hybrid work in the future. To me, what that suggests, frankly, is is less office, you know, physical office space. So I don't know how to fully interpret that. I think leases are currently uh, a part of that, but that those seem to be contradictory statements. We have the same space, but you have more people are working remote, and we're not going to change anything. So I don't exactly know. That's that's kind of the beauty of research when we investigate these things and what your future holds for this, but Again, Dave, great question. Corporate real estate, I think, is something we all need to be more aware of uh, within the facility management space. Great questions. Frank or anybody else, if you would like a copy of the slides, uh, be sure to email myself or Brian. Email addresses are posted on here, or maybe Ashley can pop up the slides again. Uh, we can certainly send you a copy of those. We'll be glad to, to do that. Brian lines at ku.edu or jake.smithwick at uncc.edu. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, N several nearly empty buildings, yep. It is very interesting what the future is gonna hold with that, yeah. Okay. Jake, only thing I have at the end here, a little off topic if you'll indulge me, is I asked to tell uh, Stephen G, I really appreciate your your job title as overall coordinator of chaos. That's well done. That's something <laughs> I can aspire to. Nice. <laughs> I enjoyed that. Love it. Love it. All right, folks. Hey, thanks so much for your time today. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you for attending this webinar. Uh, be sure to uh, reach out. Uh, this will be published here in the, in the next coming weeks and months. Uh, we're excited to work on this. And again, we appreciate your time. Have a great day. And until next time, take care, y'all. Bye.